Um, you are all here at the Youth Organizing and Education Justice Mayoral Candidate Forum. I will be your moderator. My name is Dr. Moshe Jean-Chel, and I'm the lead organizer and coordinator of the Liberation Program of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. Uh, for more than 25 years, the Brotherhood Sister Soul has been at the forefront of social justice, educating, organizing, and training to challenge inequity and create opportunity for all. With a focus on Black and Latinx youth, Brotherhood is where young people claim their power, the power of their history, identity, and community to build the future they want to see. This forum is co-sponsored by the Brotherhood Sister Soul, as Children's Defense Fund New York, Dignity in Schools New York, Girls for Gender Equity, Integrate NYC, New York Civil Liberties Union's Teen Activist Project, Urban Youth Collaborative, and the Youth Power Coalition. Thank you to all the organizations, and especially the young organizers in these organizations and coalitions. Thank you too to the people who submitted questions for the panel today. We are super excited to have all your questions and um, are excited to get them answered today with the with the candidates who are here. Uh, the purpose of this forum is to prioritize youth issues and voices on topics including educational equity, student wellness, and mental health, and transformative student support for our schools. Themes for today include, but are not limited to, of course, uh, youth criminalization, youth civic engagement, and youth power. We forum co-hosts believe that all plans for the future of New York City schools must be student-centered and community-led. Such a plan has to be co-created by students and families so as to ensure educational equity and restorative justice. In deciding who our city's future mayor is, we who can vote support candidates who share our vision for the future of New York City. During the forum, you all will answer questions um, sourced from youth across the city and submitted via social media or in preceding political education workshops. Thank you again to all the folks who submitted questions. Um, each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to each question and will answer in rotating order that I will share. We're going to go back and forth since there are only two of you today. Um, youth from co-hosting organizations will ask the questions. After each question is asked and answered, I will invite candidates to vote yes or no on a related question. While we get there at that point, the yes or no question, um, it is only a yes or no answer, so please be concise. And as a reminder, we have Spanish translation line for anyone who needs translation, and the number is 718-550-0056. And as a final re reminder, and something that I need to remember as well, um, please speak slowly so that folks can translate on the other end um, and make sure that everybody is a part of this conversation. And lastly, I know we, ad we advertised that, that Andrew Yang was going to be with us today. Um, he canceled last minute, about an hour ago, so that's not happening. Um, but I invite you all to ensure that he addresses your questions regarding educational equity as well in his own time. Okay, so we begin officially 18 minutes late, but we're here. Tech issues be damned. Um, our first question, we are going to go to Eric. And our first question is, what is your vision for the future of New York City, specifically as it relates to youth, black and brown youth, LGBTQ plus youth, youth with disabilities, undocumented youth, and other marginalized young people? Why should young people in these communities support your candidacy? Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, holding this. Uh, I think about uh, my son, uh, Jordan, and how he and I engage in real conversations. And I think about the large number of young people I have communicated with over the last uh, really eight years of being in Borough Hall and finding out uh, what do they want. And so when you ask me, what is my vision? My vision is going to come from them. It's about sitting down, engaging in real conversations uh, that was my stopwatch. I didn't want to drop off. <laughs> Engaging in real conversation on exactly what's needed. I'm going to be the first uh, mayor to appoint a deputy mayor of youth engagement. That person is going to be between the ages of 21 and 29. They will report directly to me. They're going to move around the city and they're going to find out how does a young person view this city and what are they looking for? Arts, culture, education. Uh, safety, uh, ensuring that we give them exposure to paid internship programs, but they need to shape that. You know, I'm 60 years old. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm not a youth anymore. 
And it's imperative that if we really want to engage youth and young people, we should not dictate, we should communicate. And I'm going to do that. And that's what I have been done, doing and I'm going to continue to do so. Okay, thank you, right on time, thank you. And Scott, what is your response? Well, I don't want people to just vote for me because I'm the cool candidate. I want you to vote for me because I have a serious plan to make sure that every child gets an equal education. And I don't have to tell anyone on this Zoom tonight or today. The truth is that education is very often decided by a parent's wealth and the zip code in which you live. That's just a fact. And that's in public school. That's not private school. And we have to change that paradigm. And we have to give every kid an equal education. That's just not happening. And part of the reason it's happening is because when you get to high school and you want to go to a specialized school, black and brown kids can't access that Shazat test. But politicians keep the test. When you want to go to a high school, there are geographic boundaries that don't allow you to enter other communities. That's going to change when I'm mayor. We also need a mayor who's finally committed to baselining summer jobs because you know what this mayor did when the pandemic came. What did he say to the young people of the city? We will cancel your summer jobs first and foremost. As mayor, we're not just going to expand uh, summer jobs, but we're going to give every kid an opportunity for a paid internship. We're going to look at ways to help kids who may not fit the traditional school day-to-day -day classroom, look at transfer schools, places like City Ass School or Urban Assembly. There's a lot that I want to do, but most importantly for me, I got skin in the game. I'm an older dad, a uh, little younger than Eric, but I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. They're public school kids. And as a parent, I want to give them everything. But as mayor, I got to give every kid the same as my kid's going to get. And that's what I'm committed to. Thank you. Thank you both. I have a number of follow-up questions, but we are actually going to dive into the questions that um, young people have to ask uh, because a lot of them get at the follow-up questions that I have in my head. So thank you for those answers. Um, so we're going to start getting questions that folks offered for this conversation. Um, okay, so for the 2020-2021 school year, New York City provided 57% of the budget for New York City public schools. Even with the COVID-19 pandemic, elected officials, as you all have said, have to fund our schools in a way that our students deserve now more than ever. With a spending gap between wealthy and poor school districts in New York State that is nearly $10,000 per pupil, our first youth question is specifically about funding, and a representative from Dignity in Schools will be asking that question. Hi, my name is Meryl Moshum. Um, I'm 17 years old. I'm a high school senior and I work with Dignity in Schools. I've been working for four years. Um, as you know, New York City public schools are underfunded and under-resourced, especially in schools in which the student body is majority Black and Latinx. All schools, however, need to have the necessary resources, opportunities, and staff for students like me to succeed. If you become mayor, from what would you divest at the city level to ensure that our schools and our futures are fully funded? And how would you support and encourage the state officials to do the same in order to reach this goal? Thank you, Meryl. Starting with Scott. We do underfund uh, schools that are majority kids of color. I know that because I've done the audits and the investigations as controller, and I've seen the bureaucracy eat away at the DOE, where layers and layers of administrators get hired at the expense of driving resources into all of our schools. First, we need to get our fair share from Albany. The CFE law school is still incomplete. We've not gotten the billions of dollars that we need. We need to think about raising revenues so that we can invest in every school. But we also have to realize that in an unequal environment, in an unequal education, zip codes matter. And there are a lot of privileged parents, and I give them all credit. They want what's best for their kids. So their PTAs are able to supplement an extra teacher in a classroom, after school, and the like. But if you're a poor parent struggling in public housing or as a single parent trying to raise a couple of kids, that money is out of reach. People pay for after-school programs because they have access to this, their credit card, and that has to end. Government must provide equal education, equal after-school, 
equal teaching and an equal way to make sure that every student gets the education they need. A mayor can level the playing field by demanding that every school has equal education, both in terms of funding in Albany and also making sure that if one kid gets a chess class or robotics class or an athletic class, that means every kid in every school gets it. If we don't do that, then we are creating an unfunded, unequal education. And that to me is a court case that has long been waiting to happen. Thank you. Now, Scott, I would like to ask, at the city level, how would you provide the funding to make sure that our futures are secure? One of the ways to do that is to look at the spending that's not working in the city and direct the spending that can make a difference. You know, I was one of the elected officials early on who specifically said, you know, we could cut $1.1 billion from the police budget and drive that to help kids uh, both in the school system and in the communities. Imagine instead of investing in handcuffs, we actually invested in programs that keep kids away from the prison industrial complex. That's something I've fought since my earliest days in the assembly. So I believe we can take up to a billion dollars over time, over four years, invest in interrupter programs, after school programs. We also have to do, go back to something that always worked. Instead of the cop in the school, why not have the guidance counselor in the school? Someone where kids can go to and say, hey, I'm having trouble with my family. I'm feeling a mental health episode because of I'm in a pandemic. Somebody help me. It doesn't have to be the cop in the school that you go to. So we can fund through the NYPD, redirect that money. We're also gonna have $6.1 billion in stimulus money. And part of that money has to go to the children, not just the teenagers, but the kids in the early grades who are also coming out of this pandemic. And the mayor has to be the driver in chief to equalize education, but also the kind of education that actually strikes at the heart of what kids are going through. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, I agree with uh, Scott that is something I fought for in Albany, uh, the campaign for fiscal equity of uh, the former governor, Governor Spitzer, uh, pushed through and he was giving us our equal share. Governor Cuomo changed the dynamics and we uh, did not get our equal share from Albany. We need to continue to fight for that, particularly with the assembly and Senate that we have now. Second, uh, I didn't only talk about it, I was about it. I put $160 million into our schools, particularly those schools who needed more. Uh, my uh, pupils and students would tell you, I've been a ball president that was really innovative. Everything from uh, vertical farms, uh, hydroponics, to computers, to access to information and equipment. This is something that I believe in. Third funding, uh, let's get these guys that are data tax. Every time I walk past Starbucks, I get pinged uh, with a cafe latte. How do they get my information and why am I not receiving money for the, from that? Mm -hmm. Let's tax them because of it, put that money directly into our school system to give the support and technology that's needed. And it's not only about equality, it's about equity. If I wear a pair of nine shoes and you're giving everyone a pair of six shoes, you may have been equal, but it wasn't equitable because I need a pair of nine. I'm going to look at my schools and give them what they need. Thank you, Eric. Um, okay, so as a reminder, we're going to do follow-up questions after both folks answer. We're going to ask probably one, folk, one person a follow-up question, but thank you, Meryl, for asking the question as well. Um, and so the vote, here comes the vote, get excited. Uh, the vote is a yes or no question again, and the question is, will you ensure that all New York City public schools are fully and equitably funded? What are your answers? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Look at that. Super, super easy. Okay, so to the next question, um, regarding some of the things that you all mentioned, specifically around mental health, right? Um, so remote learning and pandemic uncertainty has increased anxiety and depression among our city's 1.1 million public school students. But our students have been navigating tough conditions for mental wellness for a long time. Additionally, our schools currently have more school safety agents than, school, than social workers and guidance counselors combined, all things that you already know. While the city plans on deploying 150 more social workers, it is clear that, there, that that will just not be enough. According to the National Association for Social Workers, the suggested ratio um, is 1 to 50 in students with 
who are dealing with different levels of marginality. So one to 50. Um, and so an increase again of 150 is not going to do much to address the issue. So our next question about this is um, specifically and again about mental health and it will come from a representative of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. Hi, I'm Ariana from the Brotherhood Sister Soul and we want an increase to the budget in New York City public schools so as to dramatically increase the number of support staff. Um, this includes guidance, career, college counselors, therapists, social workers, nurses, and so much more. Um, to do this, whoever is elected and all elected officials uh, needs to institute a student support staff to student ratio that is no more than one to 100 and then match this action with the appropriate funds. Um, what will you do to center the socio-emotional wellness of students and what kinds of staff and support will you ensure all students get in New York City public schools? I believe I'm first, okay. right? Okay, uh, and, and you're right. And it should be uh, the one to 100. Uh, we should go with the experts. We have to meet the science and really we need to prioritize our funding to reach the goal. Once you identify the goal, uh, I believe it's imperative to reach that goal. And I'm committed to doing that because uh, in the state Senate, I introduced the legislation uh, that called for having social emotional intelligence being taught in our schools. But I went even further uh, as the bar president, a group of students and educators came to me and stated that they wanted to introduce meditation, mindfulness and yoga in the school at the start of the school day but the Department of Education wouldn't pay for it. So you know what I did? I paid for it. I sent them away and they came back and they were able to start teaching this throughout our school system. But let me go to a place that many people don't want to touch on. I challenge all the students that are on now, go look at lifestyle medicine and mental health disorders. The food you, that you are being fed in your school is not only hurting your heart and your kidneys, but it's impacting our mind. And now we need to start talking about a healthy environment and what the role the, role the food is, is, is playing. So I'm there to fund it. I'm there to make sure that we have the proper support staff is crucial. But at the same time, I want to think outside the box and create a more healthy environment than what we have now. Thank you, Scott. Look, teen suicide has doubled during the pandemic. And where's the mental health support that our kids need? I will triple the number of school-based social workers, not cops in schools. And I'm gonna provide full mental health professionals to respond to the crisis events that our young people are going through. And look, at the end of the day, we have to create a mental health continuum in the public schools because of the problems, both in terms of the pandemic and also in terms of just the practical issues facing kids. We've got a lot of kids who don't have parents that are able to uh, navigate the city bureaucracy, why should they have to? I would have a benefits coordinator in every single school where parents can look at the services and programs the city actually has so that they can access them. So many parents and kids are not even aware of the full opportunities nonprofit groups provide to our school system. And at the end of the day, we also have to make sure that kids coming up will understand that somebody is reaching out to them. Now, the question is, how do we make schools the centerpiece of communities with wraparound services? Because that takes a lot of money. Yes, we can get the money from Albany, but here's what we definitely can do. We can smash the, I'm sorry, the bureaucracy of the Department of Education. I've done the audits and investigations. The money being spent on that bureaucracy would blow your mind. We've got to shift the school bureaucracy, move health professionals into the school, I can show you how to pay for it because I know where the money is within the Department of Education. There's no will to upset the paradigm. There's no will. Sorry, Scott, but thank you for answering fully. Um, there's no will to upset the paradigm. Definitely heard you on that. Um, and so the follow-up question is actually to Eric. So knowing that we're in a pandemic, knowing that there's gonna be calls to address a potential deficit um, and knowing that schools need not only better food, but specifically better support staff. Schools need to have the amount of staff necessary for student success. How do you plan on funding that? So you mentioned a bit about a tax earlier, um, but what are you going to cut potentially and what are you going to, how are you going to ensure that our schools get funded? The, the, the tax that I mentioned was the data tax. That was, was it wasn't just any type of tax, it was a data tax. Uh, that's number one. 
A second, we could drastically look at the over $400 million in overtime that police officers are, are making each year. There's no reason a police officer is sitting in the courtroom of four or five to six hours in overtime waiting to testify when they can use Zoom and get off of overtime. There's no reason you see such a large body of officers at parades. All of you have saw, have witnessed that. You see just them hanging out doing nothing. That's There's no purpose for that. We could have volunteer auxiliary officers and we could civilianize our police department. Many officers are doing uh, clerical duties when we did not hire them for that and they're going on clerical, they're going on assignments that we don't need them to do. So we could decrease the manpower without decreasing the patrol strength and keeping us safe in the process. Those are substantial dollars that can go into our educational facility to really become preventive and not reactionary uh, to public safety. If you don't educate, you incarcerate. And we need to be clear on that. And that's why 30% of our uh, young people at Rikers Island are dyslexic, are such a substantial number, don't have a high school diploma or equivalency. So we must find a dollar, prioritize while dollars should go. At the root of our crisis in this city is the lack of educational opportunities, particularly in black and brown communities. Sure, thank you for that. Um, the root of our problems is the lack of, of access to education and meaningful pathways to success for students, um, for sure. Okay, to pivot to the voting question. Um, if elected, will you increase the number of student support staff and services in New York City public schools? We heard Scott say triple. We're just saying increase. Will you increase the number of student support staff and services in New York City public schools? Yes, without a doubt. Thank you. Yes, triple. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. So moving to the next question. All right. So while the city's latest rec recorded graduation rate is 77.3, the graduation rate, as I'm sure you all know, for students who are Black, Latinx, English language learners, and or students with disabilities are much lower. Our city has to create ways for all learners to succeed and graduate at excellent levels. And to do this, we will need to address issues of access. And so our next question comes from a representative of the Children's Defense Fund. Hi, my name is Sandy. Um, I am a senior in high school and I'm in Brooklyn. And I'm a beat the odds advocate and scholar at the Children's Defense Fund New York. Um, what I wanted to address is what do you think is working in our schools right now? How will you fix what isn't working? What will you do specifically to address issues of technology, language access for families, comprehensive sex education for students, and student grievance process regarding teachers, staff, school police, and administration? Andy. Starting with, all right, starting with Scott, I believe. I'll tell you what I, what I think is working and that's the teachers and the principal and a lot of the school personnel, because I see it firsthand when I take my two babies to school, my third grader and second grader, someone's out there with hand sanitizer, someone's taking their temperature and the teachers are doing an incredible job with very little help from the Department of Education. They're, in some ways, they're just left on their own. They were left on their own to open schools and to keep them open. And I think that if we're gonna make schools work for everybody, then we just have to change the way this system operates. And one of the things that I feel has broken down is the lack of foresight and planning, especially in communities of color. We don't have the programs in place. We keep having politicians and having discussions about what we would do, but the money is there to make this difference. And I think that we need a full reset in how we approach education, especially coming out of this pandemic. But the good news is I do feel very strongly that those teachers risked their lives, did a lot of work for our kids, and we owe it to them and our students to give them the education system that functions. Thank you. Eric? Yes. Uh, uh, first, uh, what I believe is working, uh, really, it's just a commitment of our educators uh, and our students. Sometimes we forget the role that students are playing, like now. Um, this is amazing what you are doing. I'm so proud that you are really engaged, and I'm seeing that all over our city. But far too many things just are not working. And really, we have education wrong. And we need to redefine education. Education is not high uh, state testing. 
we've we have taken away the joy of learning. Uh, to sit in the classroom and become robotic, by the time you get to the 10th grade, you checked out. You said, you know, why am I here anymore? And I believe that we need to redefine school, Sandy. I believe school can't be just in a sterilized environment of a building. It must be inside our community, civic engagement. If you want to learn real earth science, go to start a farmer's market in your community and then serve food to our seniors that's nutritionally sound. If you want to learn technology, be a part of building out high-speed broadband Wi-Fi to a homeless shelter so you can feel the engagement and be paid for doing so. I believe that we need to change what we think about education, reintroduce the beauty and the joy of learning, of challenging ourselves, and we're not doing that right now. And as the mayor, I'm going to do that. Thank you, Eric. And so the follow-up question is to Scott. Um, so regarding, again, access and ensuring that um, all students get what they need and all families get the support they need to support students and, and our, our learners in our schools. Um, a question to you, what would per pupil funding look like if you were mayor? Well, it would, would realize it the goal of equal education to the CFE lawsuit, but it would also guarantee through funding that every child has free high-speed internet service at home with working learning devices. Right now, we have homeless kids, 111,000 students. Uh, there's no one in charge of these kids at DOE. Uh, I did an investigation that their absences went unchecked, 75% absences unchecked by the DOE. We've got to provide the basic learning devices that kids need. If you don't have a remote learning device, if you don't have internet access, that's like in my generation when they didn't give you school books. You can't learn without it. And yes, hundreds of thousands of kids right now are teetering because they actually don't have the tools they need. That is a cost that we must bear. And then we must have the programmatic and the programmatic and administrative ability to get that done. The other thing is we have got to focus more programs. And again, there is a cost attached for multilingual students and homeless students drop mic. These are the kids who are most vulnerable. These are the kids most likely to be left behind during the system. And that is why we need uh, the kind of resources that we're, by the way, going to get from the federal government. We're gonna get a very large uh, education package coming out of the stimulus, but that's only half the battle. We have to then take that stimulus money and make real fundamental change within the system. That means addressing the homeless students, the students who are multi-language kids, multilingual students who need extra resources and finally fair funding for them. And that's what I would do as mayor. Thank you. And so the vote is not only about what's working in our schools, but about the fact that you all as candidates get to share more about what's working in our schools and actual students. So it's about student grievance processes. And so the question is, if elected, will you ensure that students have a transparent and impactful process to address their grievances with our city and schools? Yes Thank or no? You. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, next question, starting with Eric. Yes. <laughs> All right, learning in the COVID era has proven difficult for most students. We know this, we've talked about it, but we're focusing on it now. Students report issues with internet access, access to computers, or having to share a computer with all in the household, as well as difficulties with requiring, required rather learning mod modalities employed by, by teachers. Students have also had to deal with familial responsibilities and familial loss. It is safe to say that many marginalized students have struggled as a result of all of this and more. We have a question from NICLU Teen Activist Project that will address post-COVID learning. Thank you, Marsha, and hello, everyone. Hello, Kellen. My name is <laughs> Hello. My name is Kellen, and I'm a senior in Santa Ana Technical High School, and I am the communications manager of the NYCLU's Teen Activist Project. This pandemic has exacerbated existing inequities in our city. So my question to you, candidates, is regarding learning and access to vaccines and testing, what will you do to ensure student success after one and a half school years in the COVID-19 pandemic, during which learning and access to technologies were deprioritized and resources for students with disabilities were at best, severely limited. What do our schools look like if you become mayor in a post-COVID New York City? Okay. Me? Okay. Yep. 
Uh, uh, Kellen, thank you for that. And uh, let's be clear, COVID hit this, seat, this city. Uh, many people fled. I led. I put a mattress on the floor of Brooklyn Borough Hall, and I slept there for five months so I can get up early in the morning and respond to the calls of this city. And that's the type of leadership we need. And trust me when I tell you that if the number of people who were out of access to iPads and other form of technology, if they were not black, brown, and immigrant, you would have witnessed a different response in this city. They, they have written off black, brown, and immigrant students in the city. And we need to be clear on that. There's no way you could have gone months before children receive iPads, particularly in homeless shelters. That would not be allowed if it wasn't for the ethnic demographics of the students. I'm zeroing in on that. We need to, number one, we need to finally look at making a high-speed broadband and Wi-Fi. We need to make it a utility. We can no longer trust these entities that's supposed to have built that our city long ago. They're playing us. Trust me, they're playing us, and we need to stop it from happening. A second, we need to really, we should have extended the summer months last year. We knew COVID was coming back. We knew it was coming back with Avengers. We had to get ahead of the curve, and we didn't. That is how I would think it's outside the box. Communication, consistency, and we must conform. Thank you. Well, I, I didn't sleep in my office, but I did sleep in my uh, two bedroom apartment uh, with my wife and two little kids. And during that time period, not only did I have to serve as controller, but I had to figure out a way to educate Max and Miles. And that wasn't very successful. I appreciate teachers because this was not what I was good at. But think about this, as I mentioned the credit card earlier, the truth is that when our internet went down, we doubled the internet. When the kids needed a new iPad, I put the credit card down and got the iPad. The problem with this administration is they allowed the parents who had means to get their kids through the crisis. And the kids who didn't get through the crisis were the kids who could not afford a remote learning device or didn't have internet access in the public housing. And that was the great discriminator of this administration. You see mayors, when they want to, can actually make moves and move the bureaucracy. And that didn't happen in this case. And the reason I know it is because I'm investigating City Hall right now about their lack of response. Some things they did right, but a lot went wrong. And the next mayor has to be fully understand on day one what we have to do for the kids. And here's what we do have to do. We need an internet passport for every parent who needs it for their kids. We need to have revolving delivery and an access point to get the computers and the iPads into the, into the schools and into the homes. Because even when we go back to school, probably in September, the way we learn has forever been changed. And we can't just let the kids of wealth have all the resources. And the kids whose parents struggle economically can't even begin to address that. Thank you. And so the follow-up question is a question I know a number of us have been thinking about, um, and it's to you, Eric. Can you share more about this summer plan? <laughs> Some of us. I'm are... sorry, which plan? Yes, your summer plan for schools, so student summers. <laughs> yeah, my my son said, I "Hate you, Dad." You know. <laughs> so here's what what what's happening, and we have to really redefine how we do things in this city, if not the country. We have been doing things the same way only because we have been doing them the same way. So one of the things that I believe we need to examine is the agrarian calendar. Two months off, this was put in place because you know people had to go pick farm or schools were too hot, hot. We're not doing that anymore. So why don't we flex out the schedule? And it doesn't mean sitting inside a classroom, it means continuing instruction throughout the summer months. Those children that need to catch up on math and English, uh, those children that want to be part of internship programs. It's about continuing instructions. When you're in affluent communities, they have a structured summer for their children, museums, the, the stock uh, uh, Wall Street, uh, traveling abroad. That's not for our children. And we have what's called a summer slide every year. And we know it's a summer slide. So what I say, let's have a combination of remote learning, Let's have a combination of internship exposure, exposure to uh, other, uh, you know, employment, 
to other places, everything from our museums to corporate America. Let's change this thought that during the summer months, we're stopping the instruction. Let's continue that instruction for two to three hours a day. Okay. I want to know more, but we will continue. <laughs> um, so the yes or no question is, if elected, will you prior, and this is coming, let me just backtrack. This is coming because it, at different points in time, it has felt like everybody else's needs were prioritized instead of students um, for various reasons. And so regarding like vaccines, regarding testing, regarding making up for lost learning, regarding ensuring that learning is fun and actually educational and not just to a test, um, the question is, if elected, will you prioritize student and youth needs in a post-COVID New York City? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Y'all have been yeses on all this. I'm excited. <laughs> That's positive. So starting with Scott, uh, we're going to move to the next question. So for us, safety is having well-resourced communities um, in which people's lives not only matter, but they themselves thrive communities in which people thrive, that feels more like safety for us. Um, this vision of safety necessarily has to go beyond policing. Our question now is from uh, Girls for Gender Equity, and we invite you with this question to reimagine safety alongside us. Hello, my name is Nisuela Daly. Um, I'm representing Girls for Gender Equity, and I go to John Jay College, I'm a freshman. So my question is, if you're mayor, what does safety beyond policing entail for New York City public schools? And how do you plan on ensuring the safety of undocumented students? Thank you, Sister. That's a, that's a very important question. And one of the ways that we can ensure safety is stop trying to over-police our students. When you think about uh, the fact that 60% of incidents where students were taken into police custody it was three times as high for black girls as it was for white girls. And I don't think that is safety. I think that is terrifying. And as a parent, I know that safety goes beyond policing. You know, handcuffs and suspensions don't keep students safe. And, you know, when I was growing up in Washington Heights, going to public school, Kennedy High School in the Bronx, uh, look, it, it, it was a different view. You know, sure, we messed up. Sure, we didn't always do the right thing. And we had issues and sometimes the administration was just wrong about how you look at children. But this notion that somehow cops would be storming into the school or cops already in the school dragging out kids is not the solution. I believe schools should be sanctuaries for kids and families. And the way to deal with trauma is to make it culturally competent and trauma-informed adults with programs that teachers can create. That's why I want to add 2,300 social workers and guidance counselors. We got to have deep investments in transfer schools. You know, when I was a state assemblyman and worked for a state assemblyman, every semester we had city as students uh, in our in our office because these kids were so smart, so bright, but they didn't have the traditional track. But there were programs for these kids as well. Also, for immigrant students, new immigrants, undocumented students, I'm going to make sure that we keep ICE the hell out of our schools. That's it. No formal ties between ICE and the police. And last. Sorry about that. But you actually get the follow up question. So you get to share more about that. So we will get back to that point. Um, Eric, your response? Listen, safety is a prerequisite to prosperity. And I'm a big believer in that. And you know, uh, as a former police officer that fought against racism in the police department, I was arrested and beat by police officers. And didn't say woe is me. I was recruited by civil rights leaders to go and become a cop and fight from within and started 100 Blacks in law enforcement who care because I know we have to continuously fight against racism in our police department. So when we talk about schools specifically, I'm going to go day one to my schools and tell them to put together a safety committee made up of teachers and students. Let them define what type of safety measures they want in their schools. Because I have some schools where students sit down with me and say, hey, I want a, a school safety agent at my front desk. Some say we don't want them here at all. And so I don't want to treat all schools as one size fits all. I want to speak with the students on the ground, let them come together, define a safety plan with restorative justice, 
Maybe they want um, safety agents outside their parameters because remember, public safety is not only inside the school. We have a real problem with sex trafficking, recruiting on our school ground, gang members that are attempting to harm students in an environment. So let the students per school define what their safety environment should be, and then we will execute that. Thank you about that. I have a number of thoughts on that, but you get the next follow up question. So I will be sure to ask you then. Okay. You mentioned schools as sanctuary, which I think is a beautiful idea. Um, but now, can you share a bit more about how schools will be sanctuary specifically for non citizen students and even more specifically for undocumented students? How will you make that happen? Look, I think the mayor has to set a tone and I'm all, you know, I, you know, I'm all for collaboration. But it's the job of the mayor to make sure that schools are safe. And it's the job of the mayor to make sure that when the first sign of conflict comes, the police are not the first one there. You can't just change the world with a badge and a gun. You have to change the world through culturally competent, effective strategies in a diverse school system that we have. So the way you keep kids safe is you don't have the police in the schools. If there's a problem, you know where they are, they'll come. But here's what we really have to do. We have to make sure that we go back to something I had as a kid. When I was having trouble, I went down to the second floor of Kennedy High School, I think it was the second floor, and I would knock on the door to the guidance counselor. And I would say, this, this is what I'm feeling, I need help. This is what's not happening for me. I remember going to school when my parents were getting divorced. That was a difficult time in my life. What did I do? I went to the guidance counselor, but right now, We've replaced guidance counselors with police officers. And that's not the future of the school system. And that's how I would protect kids by having a zero tolerance for the lack of uh, those counselors. And I would put 2,300 guidance counselors in the system. And we can do that because this is a good safety plan. We could do it by redirecting police resources. I've identified it specifically as controller, the only candidate who put pen to paper and I would invest in the kids. And that's the first thing we do. Thank you. Okay, so let's dive into this vote. Um, if elected, will, okay, background, I keep doing this, I'll start questioning, I get the background. Um, <laughs> my apologies. But so while there are different protocols in place regarding ICE um, entry into schools, like there's a personnel in the school who get to dictate what happens and call DOE and like all of these processes, well, this one pretty extensive process. Um, New York City is still not ICE free, right? And it doesn't mean that ICE cannot stay outside of schools and it doesn't mean that ICE cannot follow students. It doesn't mean that ICE will not take away parents, right? So there are all these other ways that ICE can, can be a nuisance and also a violent and deadly force in our community. And so the question is, um, if elected, will you help make New York City schools and communities ICE free? Yes or no? Yes, without a doubt. Thank yes, you. time to melt. Uh, I'm going to read that. Awesome. So next question, um, going to Eric first. There are consequences to over-policing and criminalizing youth in schools and communities. I don't have to tell you all that, but this is what we're going to talk about right now. Very mm -hmm. um, students, as a result of these consequences, don't feel as though their schools are places to learn, but rather prisons and places in which their very ways of being are policed. Um, two interrelated important consequences of this, the way that we over police schools and students in particular um, are the school to prison pipeline and school push out. Our next question comes from the Urban Youth Collaborative and with it, we aim to get at these very issues. Hi everyone, um, Eric, Scott, hi. Um, my name is Jade, my pronouns are they, them, theirs and I'm with the Urban Youth Collaborative. Um, and my question for you two is, Marginalized students are disproportionately pushed out or forced to have negative encounters with school police, as well as policing and surveillance culture. Knowing this, what student and community led safety strategies and restorative justice approaches do you aim to institutionalize in New York City public schools once you are mayor? Thank you, I, I believe I'm first on that. Uh, thank you, Jay, uh, for that question. And I keep going back uh, to uh, what I'm going to uh, run my school and have my chancellor do. It's about those who are there, who's on that school campus. They need to create the environment 
Uh, I'm a big restorative justice uh, believer. Uh, and, and trust me, no one knows about being criminalized as a child more than I do on what I went through uh, as a young man growing up in South Jamaica, Queens. Uh, I know what it is to be over police. Uh, there's no one that's running for mayor knows what it is to be assaulted by police officers, arrested and thrown inside a cell. They can talk about it, but I lived it. And I know how that over-policing is destroying our communities. Also know this. I also know that that prison, uh, that, that school to prison pipeline is real because we are not helping people in greater needs. Those with dyslexia, only $2,000 per school to test the screen. 55% uh, of the men and women at Rikers Island don't have learning disabilities. We could prevent that if we gave the support to the parents when they need it, instead of having them sue the city to get the support. And if you don't have the money to sue, then your child believe uh, they can't learn, start slinging drugs, carrying a gun, and end up, end up at Rikers Island. We must be more proactive and not reactive. And that plan, I believe, should come from the students. Thank you. Scott? You know, we suspend 30,000 kids a year, mostly black and brown kids, uh, kids with disabilities. And there's no accident that that happens because we don't have the kind of mentorship programs, guidance programs that keep kids out of the criminal justice system. Look, I've been fighting on these issues all my life. When I was a younger state assemblyman, I remember the Republicans in Albany in the state Senate. They fought like crazy for a prison in their community. I'm not kidding you. That's all they wanted. They could build a prison in 18 months, the barbed wire, and then they would take mostly black and brown kids, ship them upstate and create economic development around a prison. That was the strategy. And we felt at the time, people like Al Van and others who were at the time, Eric knows them very well. We said, let's build schools and daycare centers. Let's keep kids away from the criminal justice system. And that has to be the role of the mayor. We will keep kids away from any attempt to incarcerate them. Look, as controller, I've seen the private prison industrial complex firsthand. I divested all of our money in the pension fund from private prisons because this is now a money maker. They want our kids in the system because it's about the money. And what I want to do is shield our students by making sure there are programs and mentors that understand who's coming for our kids. And we've got to have the strength to turn that around and say, not on our watch. Thank you. Um, and so the follow-up question is to Eric, but I would love to talk more later, um, Scott, about some of the things that you just said. Um, and so regarding safety plans, as you mentioned before, and like having each school devise their own safety plan, um, it's a two-part question, but one, how will you ensure that students are leading that effort and not just a part of it or a byproduct or someone that they are, someone who is, you know, included at the later stages, one, and two, do you believe that it is only with police free schools that New York City can ensure actual and meaningful educational equity? Okay, let's, let's do the first part. Uh, it should be a partnership, I believe, with students and faculty. Because when we talk about safety, we're also talking about everyone that's on that school campus and school ground. And we want to make sure that there's a balanced voice and come away from creating a safe environment. Because if it's an unbalanced voice, then people are going to believe that it's unfair. And so by having both students and faculty sit down together and devise a safety plan for that school, you come away with a agree upon plan that everyone would feel comfortable in that school environment. And as I stated, uh, you know, as a former police officer uh, that dealt with both sides of being a victim of a crime and abused by police and protected people, I know that outside school grounds, people prey on students. The younger the students are, the more they pray. But now we're seeing with all of the sex trafficking, a lot of our uh, middle school and, and, and high schools are really being targeted and preyed, uh, uh, preyed upon. And so when we look at, I believe that you can have a quality educational environment without over-policing the schools. It's doable. And I think that is not only doable, it's something we must reach for to make sure it, 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 it's reached. And we must respect those students because all students' voices must be heard. So we must respect those students that say, 
I want some type of peace officer around my school. We don't want to ignore them because we disagree with them. There needs to be a balance to hear all voices. Okay, thank you. And so defining police free schools, not as it's been defined in the contemporary moment, but as actually not having police in schools and not just shifting police responsibilities from the NYPD to the DOE. Defining police free schools in that way. Um, voting question, and notice that I gave the summary before, shout out to me. <laughs> uh, if elected, will you make sure that New York City schools are police free schools? When you, I just want to get clarity. When you say police free, are you talking about school safety agents and police officers or just police officers? I am talking about school safety agents and police officers. Okay, no, I won't, I won't, I won't agree to that. Okay, at first, no. Got it. <laughs> um, police free, yes, but the safety officers, no. I agree with you. So you both agree that school safety in its current iteration belongs in schools? We, see, we just want to make clarity because, well, you know, no, I appreciate trust me, the reporters listen to your shows. <laughs> and so if we say something wrong, they're going to say we're going back on something. So when you say in this current iteration, you know, I believe it shouldn't be in this current iteration. I believe we can do a better job of what a school safety agent should be. They shouldn't even be wearing uh, police looking uniforms, you know, throw on some khakis or some jeans. Uh, you know, we shouldn't look like it's a correctional facility. Okay, and Scott, do you want to clarify as well? I, I, I believe that uh, we should not have school safety officers doing discipline and intervening with kids. That's for guidance counselors, professionals, but I do think they're an important resource and uh, we should work with them and make appropriate changes as we think about how we can make the schools uh, more friendly for all the kids. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving to the next question, starting, um, at this one with Scott. So, writing that down so I don't forget. Awesome. So New York City is home to one of the most segregated school systems in America. Pausing on that because that's an important pause. Um, because of this, uh, or sorry, because of the city's admissions policies for selective schools, among other issues, and because also of like housing segregation, school zone lines, and et cetera, et cetera. We now have a school system in which segregation is entrenched. We have a divided school system that works to separate students by race and class as early as kindergarten. And I've heard you speak a lot on this, Scott, before, and I know that this is something that you also know about, um, Eric. And so our next question is, is about integration, and it's going to be from Integrate NYC. Hey, y'all. My name is Yotam Pe'er. I'm a director at Integrate New York City and a sophomore at Metropolitan Expeditionary Learning School. Integration has clear quantifiable benefits for students, teachers, and everyone involved in the process. What does your school integration plan look like? More specifically, what gatekeeping measures will you abolish? And how will you transform schools so that all students, and specifically BIPOC students, see their futures and safety prioritized equally? Starting with Scott. Is it me? Okay. Scott, or me? I didn't hear you. Okay. Um, look, I think the next mayor has to make a real commitment to integration because when you integrate society, you get better results. You get better results in schools and in communities and perhaps around the world. And I believe in it. It's how I was born and raised. It's the kind of schools I went to and look at me now. Uh, but seriously, I think I'm one of the few candidates to say, with all due respect to parents who have the ability to test kids and get them the test prep they need. And I, and again, as a parent, I'm happy that they can do that. There are almost no black and brown kids at Stuyvesant year after year, and it's getting worse. We have got to end the Shazat. We should replace the Shazat, in my opinion, with the seventh grade test, which actually measures in classroom learning. We have got to end frivolous screens, geographic screens in high schools. And look, I tested my kids in a GNT program, my four-year-old, and I look back on it and my four-year-old couldn't even spell his last name. And he's supposed to be determined whether he's a genius or not. The reason that we have those classrooms is because of the resources that come with it. And I believe we need a new education agenda that speaks to having an integrated school system with equal resources. And it's not just about what we do in the schools. 
We need a housing policy that reflects an integrated agenda in our neighborhoods to end housing segregation. Thank you, Eric. Yes, uh, uh, dead on. Uh, listen, we must integrate. And uh, your question is dead on. Uh, the benefits are just amazing of what, how if you integrate, you develop your full personhood. And let me tell you something else. Your child won't be an effective career person or professional if they're uncomfortable in existing in multicultural, multi-ethnic environments. Because if you're going to solve global problems, you must have a global boardroom that different people bring different life experiences. Now, here's the issue. Scott alluded to it, and he's, he's dead on. We have to change our zoning policies. We upzone in poorer communities, displace uh, poorer people, and we don't upzone in communities that have great schools, great trans access to transit, healthy food. We need to change that, and I'm going to push to do that. Next, we need to diversify the student body. Let's get some black, brown, and other ethnic groups into our school system. Let's rec recruit from the HBCUs. Let's recruit from the sororities, the fraternities, get them in. A uh, third, I walked into school one day in a predominantly black community, and I walked through the halls. You know what I saw? I saw all white classrooms. So it's not only about diversifying the buildings, we have to stop the game and diversify those classrooms. So there's no shortcuts to the to making sure we have integration. And that's what I'm going to produce an integrated school system. Thank you. Um, and, so, and so it's Oda Scott. Um, if you could please share more about your plan. So we know that screens are divisive and you said not no to the Shazat, but yes to seventh grade, but also GNT testing is a little, is equally divisive. Um, and so they're divisive by their very nature. And so if you could speak more about the school integration plan, including, of course, housing, eliminating the Shazat, zoning, et cetera, that would be awesome. Well, look, I, I, think, I think we have to root out any time uh, a black or brown child simply doesn't get into a class when they take a test that is not a test that reflects the knowledge in the classroom. So that has to change. And look, it is controversial. But I believe that we have to be bold if we're going to integrate the school system. I also think we need parent collaboration. Look, there's good stuff. Eric knows this in Brooklyn. Uh, I think it's CSC 15. They're doing great collaborative work on integration with parents, doing that in CEC 3. It's a start. I would mandate that kind of uh, exercise in every single school district. But getting to the point of housing, here's what's basically been happening under the de Blasio housing plan. You know, the big developers are building the housing and then they promise uh, affordable housing. But the truth is that affordable housing is unaffordable in so many of our communities of color. It's no accident that the rezonings only happen in black and brown communities. You didn't see a rezoning on the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side. They just went for the communities uh, that were vulnerable because they didn't have the means and the resources and the ability to have lawsuits and fight back. I want to change that. Any new development, 10 units or more, set aside 25% affordable housing. I want to access vacant property and vacant land to build the low income housing we need to move kids out of homeless shelters and create a true city for everybody, not just for the very rich, but enclaves for the poor, everybody. Thank you. Okay, and so we have reached our final question. Yay. Uh, I'm really excited about this question because um, organizing at its core is shifting power and is shifting power by way of people power, right? So it's nurturing and amplifying and catalyzing people power to shift power. And often that shifting power looks like shifting people in power. Um, and so the question, so the work of every youth organizing space is to build youth power. And I hope you hear that more and more because building youth power should be everyone's priority at this moment. More specifically, building youth power is democratizing power, elevating youth into positions of leadership, amplifying youth voice, catalyzing leadership and nurturing young people. Um, we believe that those closest to the problems in schools and in our communities are best equipped to solve it. And since we're talking about education justice, um, we're talking about students solving those problems. And so our last question is from the Youth Power Coalition. And it's about, again, youth power. Hey, candidates. My name is William Deep and I'm with the Youth Power Coalition. Do you believe that building youth power in the Department of Education and city overall is mandatory for the future success of New York City as a leading city in America? What do youth power, youth leadership, 
and youth voice look like when you are mayor? Lastly, how will youth hold you accountable once you are in office? Thank you, Eric. And I mean, sorry. Thank you, William. And starting with Eric. You're on mute. That's the word of the day. You're on mute. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so thank you. Thank you for that, William. And I keep leaning into this because it's so foreign to people uh, when I say that uh, we need to communicate with people who are closest to the action. And the worst thing I could do is to come to you and dictate and say, this is how you're going to do it. But if I come to you and say, give me the plan, and my deputy mayor of youth engagement is part of giving you the infrastructure and the support you need to build out that plan, all the research that's needed to come up with a formidable plan. Now it's yours to own. And then you don't come back to me later and say, hey, Eric, this is what you produce and it didn't get what we want. No, I want to be able to come back to you and say, you created this. <laughs> this is what you asked for. And we implemented, I gave you the support, the resources, and you should be able to fail and then learn from your failures and improve upon for the generation that's coming behind you. That's the beauty of where I want to go. I don't want to define for you. I had an uncle who should shake my hand and he would squeeze it and hurt it. And I would say, uncle, you're hurting me. He'll say, boy, that's not hurting me. You. And I say, uncle, don't define my pain. I don't want to define your pain. You define what you want your school system to look like and I'm going to support that. Okay, so we'll come back to you. Scott, what, are you, what is your reflection? Well, you're probably never going to believe this, but uh, I was the first teenager one of two teenagers appointed to a New York City committee board by then borough president Percy Sutton. Ended up in the front page of the New York Times above, below the fold. And it set me on the track of where I am today because I got an opportunity at an early age, not just to give back to my community, not just to hang out with the adults that were making all the wrong decisions, but I was able to make a contribution and that kept me on the road. When I became a Manhattan Borough President, I appointed teenagers and kids to the community boards because I believed in it since I was a kid. And the fact that all of you are doing this today says to me that there's a Borough President or a controller or a mayor among you. And the way we start able to start seeding that generational change is by having politicians invested you at the early age. So whether it's access to having the ability to talk to school administrators or being on a community board or being a part of a city hall agenda, I'm there for you because I'm the lived experience of what it means to be a kid from Washington Heights at Kennedy High School uh, who then gets to serve and possibly be mayor of New York City. And I'm telling you, it all started when I was a kid. Thank you, Scott. Um, and so the follow-up question to Eric, um, regarding specifically not defining for young people what uh, what they are and what they want to see in their schools, um, and also knowing, as you were saying, Scott, that there are all these bodies that ex well, they're not all. There are a couple of bodies that exist um, for young people to serve, but a number of these bodies don't have a number of young people. So they have like one or two, and even on those bodies with one or two young people, a young person doesn't have voting power. So we're keeping all of that in mind, Eric, um, specifically around like youth leadership in your administration, in the DOE, um, how do you feel about increasing the number of students and marginalized students on these bodies of the bodies that have voting power or having young people on these bodies who have more voting power than they do? And also, how do you feel about something like a student elected chancellor or deputy chancellor? I, I think it's, it's crucial to particularly uh, deputy, deputy chancellor. I love that idea. I don't want to abdicate my right to choose a chancellor because I need to be held responsible. But deputy chancellor that's elected by the students, I love that idea. And matter of fact, I'm going to infuse it into one of my policy papers. Uh, that's a brilliant idea because this gives, I want you to trust in the system. One of the things we are faced with is a lack of trust and a lack of being heard. And if you pick the person to be that deputy chancellor and he's at the table or she's at the table 
or, or whomever's at the table, you are saying you now have bought skin in the game. That's important to me because if I try to build this on my own, then I am not saying that this is a we thing, it's a me thing. It's time for us to evolve to a place that those who are greatest impact will have say so in what is actually executed. That's why I'm going to have a deputy mayor of youth engagement that is going to be a youth. That's why I appointed youth to our community boards. That is why I find out from our youth, I'm the only board president that had uh, participatory budgeting inside schools where children voted on some of the projects that they wanted. That's why I allowed them to be part of my capital projects to build out what they wanted around nutrition. That's why we pushed to get processed meat out of schools, meatless Mondays, because young people said we want a healthy en environment. I learned from them and I became better because of that. Thank you. Um, and so the votes, right? I got scared at that police free school question and I forgot to do the votes. Um, but I'm going back to the last vote and then the, the one before this and then again at this one. So the one before this, um, if elected, will you abolish screening in schools and instead pursue transformative legislation to integrate all schools? Yes or no? I, I, I would say no because I have a, clear, a backup to that. But if it's just yes or no, I would say no to that. All right, we'll come back. Scott? I, I don't want to do a blanket yes or no because it's different sections of screening and I think it's too simplistic to answer it that way, but obviously I've told you outline what I would change immediately. Okay, so we'll go back to Eric and then back to Scott for your mm -hmm. additional answers. Well, could you look at some of the screening and, and music and arts programs, look at some of the screening with other talents, what I believe uh, we should uh, integrate the different skill sets. I think there's some uh, uh, youth who have uh, learning disabilities, uh, but they still have other skills that we are denying them uh, because they can't pass one examination. And so there's a way to do it, to be fair and weighted, to make sure that we're getting across sections of the gifts and talents that students have. A gift and talent is not only being able to write or read or do math, there's just a multitude of gifts that we are leaving on the table because we're not using those different mechanisms to identify those gifts. And that's why I say I wouldn't do that. But every child should be having access to reach their full potential, develop their full personhood and skills. I couldn't stop talking in school. Little did I know is because I was going to be elected official, you know? So I should have been, that skill should have been harnessing me. I should have been placed on a debate team. I should have been taught how to better uh, express myself. And so we often look at what black and brown children do and see it as a deficit. No, let's allow them to develop those skills. We need to move towards an asset-based education. If a person speaks a different language, if they do a different thing, thing. Let's lean into that and use it as an asset-based uh, uh, education system and not a deficit-based educational system. Thank you, Eric. And Scott? You know, I told you I was appointed to the community board. Mm -hmm. What I didn't tell you was a week before I was on the school leadership team and the teacher said I had no leadership ability and was taking me off the leadership team. So I felt really bad because of all my friends, senior year, it was really messed up. But when I got to be on the community board, I was on the front page of the New York Times, the teacher taught me my first political lesson. He called me into his office and he said, okay, we never had that discussion. You're on the leadership team. You got it? I said, I got it. I shook his hand. You got a deal. And that's how I started into politics, Eric. So, but in terms of uh, integration, we have to, as I mentioned, we have to change the admissions in the high school level. We have to look at geographic screens. I think when it comes to GNT, the one area that I think is interesting is the GNT is not just for the kids who are accelerated. The GNT program is also for kids who are struggling and they get extra help because they were able to pass the test. And I think we need to create programs for all kids, especially the little kids, because their future is just unfolding. And I do think we need to invest in subsidized childcare for the parents who struggle the most in the city. I call it NYC under three to give kids the opportunity to get that knowledge and that opportunity in childcare. For middle class and upper middle class parents, child care is $21,000 a year. But under NYC, under three, with legislation I have in Albany, we would have the largest child care program in America right here in New York City. Awesome, awesome. And so to the last voting question, thank you both. Um, if elected, will you increase the number of student position on positions, plural, 
cool. On decision-making bodies and support student-led efforts to transform the Department of Education. Starting with Scott, yes or no? Definitely yes. Awesome, Eric? Uh, yes for me as okay. well. Awesome, 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 awesome. So thank you all <laughs> for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. Thank you for answering our questions. Um, and thank you for helping to vision what education justice looks like in New York City. I'm clear that there are some points of contention, but I imagine that this is the first of many conversations. And so I invite you all to also think about how to incorporate more youth voice in your campaigns um, as you move forward and also in the future should you become uh, mayor. And so I wanna just share out to folks here as well, like part two is tomorrow. So definitely tune in tomorrow as well as we continue to talk to candidates um, and also engage with Scott and Eric on their own social media platforms and their own websites. Um, if you have more questions or concerns as well. And, 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 and join the campaigns, you know, one that you like. And I, I forgot to give a real shout out to Sue. I'm a John Jay alumni. You go, Sue. <laughs> Me too, by the way. Two John Jays in one Zoom. Okay. New York City. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Awesome, awesome. Thank you all. Take care. Yeah. Good night.